First John chapter 4, let's study. First John, if you don't know that in the Bible, if you need a Bible, raise your hand. We've got ushers ready to hand you one. If you forgot yours in the car or don't have one with you today, please. It's great to have, we're a verse by verse church. Although this morning's message is going to be a little different and like I said, we're really in a, in a rushed time frame this morning. But as we've been studying through 1 John, after hearing warnings about blessings that would be missed, that, that your joy would be complete, that after handled, after seeing, after touching, these things we make known to you, that our joy would be complete. John was telling us that, Christian, your joy is found when you and I share with other people. That's when the happiness comes. People tell me all the time, hey, how come, if Jesus is the answer, then why do I still feel dot, dot, dot? My question, as we saw in the message last week, are you caring for others? Are you ministering in his name? That is where the connection comes. And so we see after handling, after touching, we proclaim these things that our, your joy and my, our joy would be complete. That was First John chapter 1. Then we saw the things about nominal Christianity. They went out from us because they were not really of us. Because had they been of us, they would have never left us. And so that answered the question for us, what about Joey, Joey who was so on fire for God and he led a home group and now he doesn't even believe in God, he doesn't even want to come to church. What about those people? Well, the scripture told us they went out from us because they were not really of us. For had they been of us, they would have never left us. And so the Bible just answered that one nice and clear. And that is, you might have a strong religious experience, but you are not a child of God because once one is born again, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so if we walk out, that is saying, we were not the ones who genuinely committed to him because he didn't leave us. Then we've been warned about wolves in sheep clothing. We've been recognizing that there are mindsets that are anti-Christ, meaning against the word, the will, the way of God. And we're going to see that again. So, in summary again, after warning about blessings that would be missed, nominal Christianity, wolves in sheep clothing, now John is going to call us today in chapter 4 to start using discernment. Discernment. And it's very important that we understand this. But let me have your eyes this way for a second. I'm going to give you this disclaimer, and then I'm going to pray for a miracle. The disclaimer is this. This morning's message... There's no way to get around it. It is very important. It's one of the most important subjects that we can talk about in Christianity. So, if you are visiting with us this morning, please come back. Um, please know that this morning's message is a little heady. It's a little Bible college class. But at the same time, I want to let you know that my, my covenant to you is I want to stir us up, to educate us up, to send us out, to be useful, intelligent tools for the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. So this morning is going to be a little put on your thinking cap. But at the same time, I've got a shorter Sunday to do it, so I'm going to run really fast. So here's the thing. There may be 30, 40, 50% that you're not going to get. Please don't allow the enemy to get frustrated. Jot down what you do get because you're going to leave here more enriched than if you didn't come at all. Amen? And as you hear these things more often and more often, then they will sink in. I remember the first time I heard things on prophecy, it just went... But then as it began to be reaffirmed... Then it began to build and I began to understand the prophecies in the Bible a whole lot better. So that's where we're going to go this morning. So let's pray that God would give us understanding, give me the ability to communicate clearly. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Spirit of the living God, we ask that you would now fall afresh upon us. Lord, talking about who you are, Jesus, there is no more important subject. More wars, more confusion, more battles amongst even the bodies, the different names and cults, Lord. These things have happened because of not understanding who you are, what you said, what God's intention is. And so, Lord, may we not look at what man has done with the miscommunication. But Father, may we look to who you are and what you have said. And so, Spirit, come and teach us right now. Lord, the Bible tells me that these things must be spiritually understood. The natural man does not understand the working of the Spirit. And so, Jesus, I pray now that I and all of us in this room would now decrease and that you would increase in us. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock, our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, 1 John, chapter 4. Join me at verse, verse 1. Excuse me. It says this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Would you underline that? It says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but what's the next word? Test. 
But test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, the first thing I want you to write is that word spirit. That word spirit is the Greek word pneuma. Spell it overhead. You can see it on the screen. Pneuma is a very interesting word because it means the word spirit. It also means the word breath. It also means the word wind. Many of you guys are familiar with pneumatic tools. Where the air comes through, that's where it comes from. Same usage of the word. And so that's one word, pneuma, is breath. It's the same as wind and spirit. Now, those of you who know your Hebrew, it's the same also in Hebrew, but it's the word ruach. And in ruach, we have the same thing, all three. It's important to see where this comes together. Because what we're being told right away is that you and I are to test the pneuma. We are to test the winds of doctrine. We are not just to follow the winds of our society, the winds that are blowing in our present culture. We need to test them. We should not do things, agree with things, join things, just because, quote, everybody else is. And that means, folks, including in and out of the church. In and out of the church, we need to use discernment. Just because a man, a woman, is proclaiming from a Bible, from a Bible study, does not necessarily mean they are teaching the clear and unadulterated Word of God. Amen? Let's go to Ephesians 4. Keep your finger here and let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. And I want to show you something real important. Ephesians chapter 4, find me at verse 12. 10 and 11, he's talking about now there are some as pastors, some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists. And all of these have a job description that he's given. And it's four, he tells us, starting at verse 12. So in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, you there? Ephesians 4, 12 says this. For, we have our different gifts in the body of Christ for equipping of the saints for the work of service. We talked about that a lot last week. To the building up of the body of Christ. Verse 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure and stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Now look at verse 14. As a result, if we're doing these things, church, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried out, notice, by every wind of doctrine. By trickery of men, by craftiness, deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, please underline that. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. He's saying that we have different gift mixes in the body. And so I have gifts, you have gifts, and we are to use those to help mature, to grow up one another. We each have a responsibility and a privilege to do that. But why do we need to do that? So that we can individually have discernment. You are not always going to have a pastor, a home group leader, a Bible study teacher with you. And so we need to be grown up, so not just children in the faith. Now, I'm going to say something again. Might be a little cutting at the ankles, and I apologize. But again, if we can't get down and dirty together, then how effective are we going to be out there? I've noticed one thing about mechanics. They're dirty because they're getting into my engine. They're getting into things, and they're fixing what needs to be fixed. Folks, the question is, how effective are we out there? What kind of compromise is going out there? Hence, the last time we've checked on our functionality when it comes to serving the kingdom of God. And are we growing up? There are people who've been in the church 10, 12, 15 years, but how mature are you? Mature not in age, but mature in actual strength and content, spiritual gifts, discernment, and and fruit in our lives. And he says that we are called to be a part of these things, Bible studies, encouraging one another, so that There is an equipping, there is a usefulness, and that we're not going to follow every wind of doctrine. Now, here's the interesting word, doctrine. That means he's talking about theological talk. Theological talk. Every wind that flows through. Now, I was planning when I was preparing this sermon that at this point in time, I was going to give you guys my prosperity pimps update. Because you would not believe the things these guys are still sending me in the mail unbelievable. But I'm going to save that for another time when we can go into it a little bit more because there's just way too much to cover. But I do need to say this, church. I need to say this. That we need to be showing discernment, as I said, 
in and out of the church. What things outside are not of God, but definitely what things even inside Christianity are not of God. And I will go on record again for saying, especially after what I saw two weeks ago in the Philippines, families living on a buck a day, doing the best they can to survive. I have a hard time with a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ spending $22,000 on a toilet. When I recognized what 10 bucks could do with a family in that country. What I also found was amazing was how many people came up to me and said, you know, Waxer, I felt you might have been a little harsh on that because, hey, if a person earns it, isn't their prerogative to do with what they want to do with it? Yes and no. Doesn't the Bible say that every good and perfect thing comes from the Lord? So aren't we supposed to be the stewards with this good stewards with whose money? The Lord's money. And I don't think he wants 22,000 going down the drain when there's people whom we can minister to. You picked up on that, huh? All right. You guys are quick. We can be blessed, but extravagant, stop it. There's no need. If God has richly, abundantly blessed you beyond, then recognize that there's a purpose for that, and that is to bring glory. Let's live simply so that others might. Simply live. Amen. Okay. Now, let's go to verse 2. Verse 2 says this. By this you know the Spirit of God. Verse 1 tells me I'm supposed to test. Well, what's the test, Pastor? How, how can I know? I, I'm, I'm game, I want to do it. Well, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that is coming and now is already in the world. Okay, look at verse 2 here. By this you know. So hopefully you underline that, because whenever the Bible gives me one of those, I'm like, yeah, I like those. This I know, the Spirit of God. The wind, the breath, the Spirit of God. What is the first criteria? It says right there. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the, what's it say? In the flesh. Okay, underline that. That's the first one. The first criteria that is this from God, is does it confess the humanity of Jesus Christ? The second criteria is that in every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Now let's look at the first criteria. Number one, that Jesus has come in the flesh. Remember, some of you, we talked about this when we did the intro to this book. That this is a direct response to two heresies of the day. Remember what they were? Remember, docetism and Gnosticism. Okay, docetism and Gnosticism. Remember, docetism said Jesus was not really a man. He was a spirit manifesting to look like a man. But since matter is evil, God could not have become matter. And so for that reason, he just looked like he was an angelic form, but he was never fully a human being. And so they challenged the flesh. We're going to talk about why that's a huge problem in a little bit. The second thing, Gnosticism talked about the same thing in a, in a different sense, and that is a larger God and a material God, a God that creates the material but once again is involved in the dirtiness, and yet you have a super divine who's separate apart. And so these two heresies of Gnosticism and Docetism, and there was even some for you Bible, sol- col- uh, Bible college students, Docetic Gnosticism, where there was actually groups that were harmonizing these two together. The point is that he's saying right off the bat, the first thing that we need to recognize is that there is a challenge here to the incarnation God becoming a man and he says the spirit that denies that ignores that that is not from God but a spirit that says Jesus is all God and all man God in a bod Jesus Christ that's from Jesus that's from the father amen But now let's look at the second one, the last part there. But it says, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus. Now, let me have your attention for a second. Some might argue in saying that's just a rhetorical in the negative. Everyone that confesses that Jesus is from the flesh is from God. But everyone that does not confess Jesus in their meaning is not from the flesh. But you know what? I find the Bible is never really short on giving detail when detail is to be given. You ever notice that? Come on. Sometimes, let's be honest, we're doing our devotions and we're like, overshare. You know, da 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 And then he said, and then I went to the house and I told him, da 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 like I just read that in chapter before. He could have said, see above. 
The Bible is very clear when we need to know information. And so I do not believe that. I think there is much, much more to that. That it does not include just coming in the flesh. I believe it is referencing something that we are to recognize. Now look back at verse 1. Verse 1 says that we are supposed to do what with the spirits? We are to test the spirits to see if they are from God. Well, one thing that I have learned, church, in being a Bible college professor, teacher, myself, doing some seminary work and other things, I've learned about giving tests. Here's rule number one when it comes to giving a test. If you're going to give a test, you better know the answer first. It's really embarrassing when they come up and ask you a question and you're completely clueless. You need to know the subject if you're going to test. Amen? So Christian, here's the thing. Do you have the skills that the Bible is asking us to be ready, willing, and able to take any book that's handed in front of you and discern whether this is truly the Word of God. You see, somebody asked me when I was in Manila, hey, what about so-and-so? And I don't have the time to go into it, so I'm not going to give you this individual's name, but I brought up to her attention the same thing I have done with you a plethora of times. And that is if I had two glasses of water, one of them had two drops of strychnine, this one had 95 drops of strychnine, which one are you going to drink? The answer is? Neither. Okay, neither. It doesn't matter that this one is 99.88888% pure. The two drops will kill you. You see, two pills that are the exact same size and they're white, are they exactly the same thing just because they're white and they're same size? No. One, one is arsenic, the other one is aspirin. It's not the similarities that we need to look at. It's the differences that will kill you. Amen? Amen? And so when someone then comes up and says, hey, but what about such and such and all these other things? That's great. But all they need to be off is on any point and they are off. Do I make sense? And so we need to recognize here that we need to know what it is we're talking about if we are going to be people who are going to test the Spirit's to see if they are from God. Believe it or not, church, believe it or not, the very first struggle in world history, church history, with Christianity was not a struggle with God, with Jesus' deity, but with Jesus' humanity. The first struggle that the early church had to defend was not proving that Jesus was God, but arguing in the fact that Jesus was God in a body. That the incarnation fully took place. First Timothy, look overhead. First Timothy 2.5. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. Now again, people see these and they want to take them out of context. And they're saying, oh, you see right there, your own Bible just says that Jesus was just a man. No, it doesn't say just a man, but it does say that he is and was a man. Amen? You see, the Bible has clearly been artic arguing, articulating all the way from the very beginning that people would clearly know who is God. So we are going to look today, as I said, in a little kind of a Bible college class at a subject called Christology. Christology, those of you who are uh, educated, you know, ology, the study of, the study of Christ. There is no subject more important to a Christian than Christology. And what makes Christianity so unique is it is the only faith that has such a subject, Christology. There is no Buddhaology or Muhammadology. There isn't. Because Jesus is the only holy man prophet, as they would say, who claimed to be fully God and fully man. Amen? And so for that reason, dear ones, we need today to say, does the Bible say that? Do I believe it? Can I discern it? And can I explain it? And that's my hope for us in 30 minutes. <laughs> All right, now. Paul warned us from the very beginning that there would be people who would come on stage to start messing with Jesus. Take your Bibles and turn with me if you would. And let's go to, the first one I want you to go to is 2 Corinthians. Join me at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. What we deal with today was warned from day one through Rabbi Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 4. 2 Corinthians 11, 4 says this. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, if that's not already highlighted, I suggest you make it that way, preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, 
or you receive a different spirit which you have not received or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. He's saying, you know what, guys? When someone comes up with a different gospel, a different Jesus, you handle it well. You don't just let it infuse. You come up and you speak the truth in love as we saw in Ephesians. And Paul was saying, good job. You guys do not allow compromise. You don't allow heresy. But at the same time, you don't make it a... a of an attack the individual, but explain the doctrine. As we saw Apollos um, being corrected and, and, and trained up by Priscilla and Aquila when they come and gave him a little more information. Hey, let me explain to you a little fuller this Holy Spirit and who he is. Now, if you wouldn't mind, go to Galatians. So go to the right just a little bit and go to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Very important we grasp this one too. Galatians chapter 1. Join me at verse 6. Galatians 1, 6 says this. I am amazed, I love how he says it, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different, or the other word is another gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even though we, notice, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we have preached, let him be, what's it say? Accursed. Now, let me have your attention this way. He says, listen, we have shared with you who Jesus is, what the word of God says. And for that reason, let's not veer from that. There are things in Christianity that we can call the gray areas. There are things that are clearly the black and white. The issues of salvation, who Jesus is, these are not negotiable. Whether or not we are going to be raptured immediately, right before, mid, after, these things, people have their different views. That is not going to cost one their salvation. But I'm going to tell you today in love, messing with the description of who Jesus is and what Jesus did can and will cost you salvation if you are not biblically correct. There is no, well, that's your truth, but not my truth. And the way I love to explain that is this. And I won't do it here in the room again for the sake of time. But I'm giving you how to do it when you're in a group of friends. If I was to say to someone and say, hey, Ryan, describe to me my mom. Who do you think my mom is? Tell me how tall she is, color of her hair, what color her eyes are. Okay, so give me that. What do you think about that? And when I throw that out, and then I would say, why don't you do the same thing? Tell me how tall you think my mom is. And the next person, hey, tell me how tall, what color eyes you think my mom is and go for it. And so I ask these people to tell me. Now, first person comes to Ryan and goes, well, uh, your mom probably has blue eyes. And since you're tall, she's probably about 5'8". And uh, who knows what your real color hair is. So we don't even know what her color hair is. So... Uh, uh, we'll say blonde, okay? Okay, great. But then all of a sudden, Vi says, you know, okay, well, I think your mom's eyes are probably brown, and she's probably got brown hair, because I look at your roots, and that's really what they look like. And so, uh, I'm da 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 but you know what? I think you're taller than, because I know my brother's taller, so your mom's probably like 5'5". Five, five. And then the next person gives a description that says, well, she's actually 5'6", and, 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 and has red hair, you know, and has these hazel eyes. Well, the point is, is it doesn't matter how fervently Ryan believes that my mom is six foot foot tall, has blonde hair and blue eyes, and he sells all that he has and has a crusade and goes around fervently saying, Waxer's mom looks like this. It doesn't matter how fervently he believes that and that is his conviction. At the same time, my mom cannot be five, six, six foot, uh, five foot six, or five foot three. She can't have blonde hair, red hair, blue hair, although as we look around the room, some of us have tried to do that. But naturally, Cannot be all at the same time. The point being is what matters is not what your view of her is. What your opinion is. What matters is who she really is. Amen? Amen. By the way, she is blue-eyed. Blondish hair. And five foot six. That's who Kathy Tipton is on her physical appearance. Now, we need to recognize that he is saying, guys, we need to get it straight. Well, the point is, is this has never been quite easy because everyone has tried to throw in their opinion. In fact, it took the early church four different councils to finally make it clear so that the subject would no longer be open to opinion. The first council, most of you know, 325, the Council of Nicaea. And as I said before, the first challenge in the church was actually proclaiming, defending his humanity. So the Council of Nicaea said Christ is 
fully divine, okay? The humanity and the divinity together. And so understanding that he is fully divine. So unlike Dan Brown, as he said in his book, the uh, Da Vinci Code and all these other things, clearly understood, the vote was 316 bishops, 314 said yes, clearly divine, two said, I don't know. And yet you hear many, many of your professors at UH say, well, even in the Council of Nicaea, it barely even passed that he was in fact divine. Hogwash, do your homework. 314 to 2. I don't call that a close race, huh? Do we have to go looking for the hanging chad? You know, no. It's there. So clearly in 325, Nicaea, Christ is fully divine. The next council was 381, Constantinople. In Constantinople, they had to come and make sure they understood now he's fully human. Because as they first said, fully divine, then people started taking the abuses there. And as I said, Gnosticism, Docetism began to take over. So no, 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 he's both. Fully divine, fully human. Then in 431, we had the council of Ephesus. And then we had to say that he is actually a unified person. All God, all man in one body. It wasn't like a cocoon shell held the spirit and blah, 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 blah. Because people were trying to explain it. Whenever you use earthly terms to explain a divine principle, you're going to have shortcomings. Amen? Amen? And so we needed to recognize this. And so they brought this thing. And then the last one in 481, the Council of Chalcedon, that is the one that said Christ is human and divine in one person. And so through these four different councils, they brought it together so that we could clearly understand. Why do I bring that up? Just so that we can have dates that we can write? No. The point is being is that from day one, the Christians have been doing what Paul asked us to do, and that is to clearly articulate to the world around us who our Lord and Savior is. Because as Christians, what is so important to us is not just what our teacher did and taught. What is important is who our Jesus is. Amen? Amen? Okay, are, are you guys still with me all out here? Okay, you guys are going like, uh -huh. just raise your hand. Give me that old, lost me half hour ago look, okay? Just help me out. We need to recognize this. Now, do we have examples of Jesus' humanity in the Word of God? Absolutely. And again, for the sake of time, just look overhead, please. And you can jot down the scriptures and jot them up yourself. Let's look at Jesus being tired, okay? Tired. Matthew 4, verse 38. And he himself was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Now, newsflash, this was not the SS whatever that he was on. Okay, this was not a carnival cruise ship. I have taken you who have been in Israel and I showed you that boat. And it is no longer than the distance from where this is to my pulpit. And imagine you've got 12 adult men and the sides of the boat are no higher than this. So if the sides of the boat are only this tall, 16 feet, Brada is in the back, sound asleep on a boat that's obviously doing this, I would say he was tired. Amen? I mean, some of you guys are like, oh, the water. He's like, oh, God. Now, some of you know that I never surf with you on Sundays after church. Duh. With all the energy that I use up here and sharing with you and loving on people afterwards, I go home, walk in the room and go, he's just fed 5,000 he's ministered he's done this that talked cared would a spirit get tired oh. next one how about hungry one of my favorite no duh passages in the Bible Matthew 4 2 and after he fasted 40 days and 40 nights what's it say oh come on say it nice and loud he duh any of you fasted for a day? What did you feel at the end of the day? Hungry. Does the spirit get hungry? You see, there's even another one here in Matthew 21, 18. Now in the morning when he returned to the city, he became hungry. We've got God in a bod here. How about thirsty? We've got John 4. When a Samaritan woman came and draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? John 19, 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished in order that he, that scripture might be filled, he said, I'm thirsty. Now, I've got to explain that one to you. Remember, we'll hear a little bit, little bit more about this when we get to Easter. But when you're hanging on a cross, you die of suffocation. The pressure pulling up inside there. And so all the force within your larynx and everything, and you die of suffocation. 
And so for him to speak, he would have to pull himself up on the nails in order to speak. And so his throat is completely parched. This wasn't, hey, I just finished putting a whole bunch of stuff in the container. I'm thirsty. No, this is the fact that I am dying. The bloods and the fluids are draining out of me. And he says, I'm thirsty, meaning he wanted something to drink so he could speak. So that he'd be able to proclaim his last and final words to us on the cross. Are these the actions of a spirit? No, this is a man suffering. You say, the great irony that I have found is this, that today's society has no problem believing that a man can become God or a God's. But they have a hard time believing that God can become a man. Don't you find that interesting? If you're God, you can do... So I don't think becoming a human is too hard on the list. Check. (laughs) Check, check. Create the winds, the heavens, the earth, the universe... Salvation, become a human, check, check, check. How could he do both? Because he's God. Hey Amen. Isn't it funny how we think? It's crazy, but oh, I can believe that I can become a God. You've got, you know, Shirley McLean, I am God, I am God. No, you're silly. You're missing it. You're confused. And Jesus has died for your sin. You see, folks, why is it so important? You might be sitting and going, well, actually, what's the big point? Why is it so important that we clearly define that Jesus is a human? Two reasons. Number one, theological. Jot this down. Theological. First reason is that we have no atonement. The big word, propitiation. Remember, we've talked about this a lot in the past. If I took your 2008 Toyota Sequoia and wrapped it around a telephone pole crashed it, walked away, thankfully, unscathed, came up to you, said, hey, I just totaled your vehicle. You were like, are you okay? Really, you're saying, what about my car? But you you are saying, are you okay? And you say, yes, I'm okay. Then you're thinking, what about my car? And I say, hey, no worries about it, no worries. I'll make pono, I'll make it right. I will take care of you. You're like, okay, great. And I show up the next day with a 1972 Datsun with the car door hang on by a coat hanger. Milk crates for the seats and show you the keys. There you go, boo, good gas mileage. I did not make propitiation. If I destroyed a 208 Sequoia, I need to give you back a 208 Sequoia. Man, humanity sinned against God and only humanity could pay the price for our actions. And so thus Jesus Christ had to be a human for if he was only a spirit, then the price is still not paid for what humanity has done in sinning against God. But now that we have a substitute, Jesus Christ, who took my place. You've seen the whole story I've talked about in the dramas as far as having um, the, the judge say you are guilty, but then come down off and then himself take the punishment and take the price. That is the first and most important thing that we recognize why he needs to be. But there is another reason, and I would say almost equally important reason. Please, if you would, have you flipping around, but go to Hebrews now. Hebrews chapter 4. Join me at verse 15. Because I want you not to know this is my word, I want you to see from the word of God. Here's the second reason, which I think is critical and important as well. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. In Hebrews 4, verse 15, it says this. For we do not have a high priest who cannot, and what's that word there? Sympathize. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Go two chapters over. Go to chapter 2. Join me at verse 18. Hebrews 2, 18. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has, notice the word, suffered, He is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Dear ones, let me have your attention. I know I've stated this many times, but for the sake of those who would be visiting with us this morning, please remember that a temptation is only a temptation if you want to do it. That's what makes it a temptation. Definition of term, hello. Anybody tempted to hit yourself over the head with a two by four? Okay, and if you raise your hand, I have two words for you. Therapy. All right, now. 
We're not tempted to eat raw liver. We don't have any like, ugh. So when it says that the greatest thing for me to also apply in my life, Christian, is that I do not have a God, a, a, a theological presence, a mist, a, some kind of divine holiness that can cover me of my sins, but I have a personal relationship with one who knows what it means to be hurting, to be lonely, to be mocked at, to be laughed at, to have all of the things that we have gone through. And if I had the time, and when I teach this in a course, we go through every single human ex- experience and emotion and I show you that Jesus went through all of these. The point is, is that we get to come to Jesus. You see why I challenged us on New Year's Eve is I said, guys, I want to encourage us as a generation to use his name. Come to Jesus. So often, oh, the Lord or God or, you know, one of the things that Christ did. Those are great, but those are all his titles. But Jesus is my friend my Savior, my Maker, my Redeemer, the one who is closer than a brother, the one who knows my heart, who knows what it's like having to teach and preach and minister to people and then have those very same people then sometimes completely go right out and in moments turn around and start snipping at one another and backbiting one another and having little nuhas and hoo-hoos and all kinds of stuff. He saw his own disciples, well, which one of us is the greatest in the kingdom? I'm sure he just wanted to go, have you not been listening? But he didn't do that, so I can't do that. You see, we have a friend. We have a maker. We have a savior. We have Jesus Christ. And that's why it's so important. You see, the incarnation, please hear me in this church, the incarnation did not involve the subtraction of deity, but the addition of humanity. I'll say it again. The incarnation did not involve the subtraction of deity, but the addition of humanity. He is all God, and now he's adding humanity to that so that he would say, Waxer, I know how you feel, brother. Bring your heart. Bring your heavy laden. Bring your loneliness. Bring your fear. Bring your worries. Because, bro, I know what that's about. I went through puberty. I went through junior high. Been there. Done that. Now, what about his deity? The phrase, I am God, is not necessarily a verse that we find listed amongst the Gospels. We don't see Jesus directly saying the words, I am God. And so for that reason, we all have professors and people and skeptics who will write on blogs and say, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, did Jesus claim to be God? Yes. First of all, people picked up stones because they said he claimed to be God and they were about to kill him. So they obviously thought he said something that claimed to be God. He also identified himself with the oneship of the Father. He also used the phrase, I am, which we know in in Exodus chapter 3 was only revered for God. He said, who shall I say? Moses said, who shall I say is sending me to Moses? The I am. And Jesus uses such a phrase that was punishable by death. Matthew 16, chapter 17, John 8, John 10, Philippians 2. As I said, if we were going to do a study of this at length, I could go through this. But the question does bear asking. Why not just say, I am God? Why did Jesus not put these phrases directly in our words? Well, because of this. Please, please hear me. Because of its constant uses in our society, most people have forgotten, or maybe they never knew, that God, as I've said before, is not a personal name. As I said, God is not his name, it's his job description. Name Elohim, Yahweh, Jehovah. And so it is a position. It's not even necessarily a noun. It's more of a verb. It's more of an adjective. It is a descriptive of whom he is. Elohim is God. Jesus is God. It is their position. And so the point of the matter is it's very similar to that which is the word reverend. I was taught in seminary to be careful of any man who introduces himself as reverend. Because reverend is something you should be called, not something you call yourself. It is a recognition of one's worth and title. Same thing in the area, I believe, at least as pastor. If I am your shepherd and your heart is and says, hey, pastor, and you reach to call me out as pastor, that is your admonition. We have a really good friend here. The brother is about 55 or so years old. In my culture, he is my kupuna. And so for that reason, as my kupuna, he goes first. But whenever I go to have lunch with Hema, we both have a fight at the door. 
because I say you go first, but because he is Tongan and he grew up in the fact that his pastor, his shepherd, is the one who guides him into all truth, then he was taught by the way of acknowledging and honoring God, I honor him. And someone can, no, you go first, no, you go first, no, you go first, no, you go first. And then I, then I just go, yeah, okay, I'll go. And I go in. You see, it's something that one is called. So, what do we know about Jesus? Well, we know that if Jesus is God, we know that thus he is not arrogant, he is not prideful, he is not boasting. How do I know that? Well, 1 Corinthians 13, you go back and read that list of what description of love is. And if God is love, you right there, you know the list of what he's not. Amen? And so if we have that, then we need to understand something. If it's something that you are called, recognize that Jesus did not clearly say the words, I am God, but we know that Jesus clearly defined and fulfilled, hear me clearly, every description of who and what God would do and God would be. Then we were to see these things by knowing He's fulfilling the promises and the fulfillments of Scripture, then we would say, the Lord, He is God. Amen? Hey, can I prove that to you? You betcha. Jot this down. I don't have time to turn there, but Matthew 9. In Matthew 9, we have the list of the miracles. Because we studied Matthew just last year, I'm not going to go in there. But we see the lame, we see the blind, we see the hungry, we see all these miracles that are being fulfilled in Matthew chapter 9. You see, the point of the matter is this. In Matthew 9, if you remember, with all the miracles that we're doing, Jesus was doing, the Pharisees themselves knew these signs had to be supernatural. And so for that reason, if you recall, they said it was from Satan. They knew what he did could not be done by man. And they had their, their, their bias would not allow him to say Jesus is God. So they said, oh, he does these things in the power of Satan. And if you remember, what does Jesus do? He goes, why would Satan fight Satan? What's up with that? It's not even logical. But the point is, is when you saw the things that Jesus was doing in Matthew 9, the reason why the Pharisees were so upset were because they knew their Old Testament like we are learning on our Wednesday nights. Commercial plug, come be there. Look overhead at Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 35, verse 4, this they knew Jesus was fulfilling. Say to those with an anxious heart. Take courage. Fear not. Behold. Who's coming? Your God will come with vengeance. With recompense of God will come. But he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened. And the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. I could show you scripture after scripture that says the God. When God comes. Blind. Healed. Deaf. Speaking. So on and so forth. And all these miracles. And so they said. Oh. This. This. Everyone was going. These are the signs of God's coming. Well, it can't be God. Maybe, maybe it's Satan. And they're starting to grab for bones and throwing things out. Let's not forget these other scriptures. Here, let's look at this one. Titus 2.13. Look overhead. You can jot it down. Titus 2.13. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our note, great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So obviously the rabbi, Paul, figured it out and knew who he was. Amen? Hebrews 1, verse 8. But of the Son, he says, thy throne, notice, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. Now, if we had the time, I'd have you go into that whole context. You can go back and read it later today. But that chapter, Hebrews 1, is the Father, God speaking. And in the context right here of this Hebrews passage, you have the Father, God the Father, clearly defined because he's speaking to the angels and speaking to all who are in his heavenly kingdom. But of the Son, he, meaning the Father, says, thy throne, O God. Folks, there is God the Father calling Jesus God. To me, that's a slam dunk on the Trinity. Amen? I'll be available for conversation afterwards if you disagree. But just know that we have a handout for you in the office, come get it, that has this many scriptures that shows that Jesus is God. That the Bible clearly, and thus the people of the first century who understood the prophetic utterances, recognized that He is God. The demon said, what do you want with this almighty God? Everyone recognized these things as far as being 
from God. They were going to stone him because he claimed things that were being God. Now, here's the other question that people often ask. Okay, if Jesus is God, then what about the Son of God? You see, Son of God, Son of God, it's all over the New Testament. What is this Son of God business? Did the early Christians believe that Jesus was God or did they believe that he was the Son of God? The answer is yes. <laughs> Moving on. No, okay. Do those two titles mean the same thing? Yes. The term son of, as I told you before, and again, remember, this goes all the way back to our studies in Matthew, but many have come since then. The term son of is not used in the biological sense here. The term son of is that which is in the lineage of, in the line of. And so when it says they're the son of God, it's not saying just the offspring, but it is the very root of, the very seed of. Notice David, and excuse me, Jesus is also called the son of David. Yet David was many, 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 many years before. In the lineage of that which is in the very vein of David, the Messiah would be the son of David, the son of God. And so when he is saying it, it's a term of the humility expression of saying, I am the very root. I and the Father are one. How can you split one? One is one. You're going, ooh, bro, that was deep. The Pharisees were very upset when you look in the New Testament when he called himself the Son of God for they knew he was identifying himself as God and they picked up stones to destroy him. Now, if he was the son of God, then why did Jesus often refer to himself as the son of man? I mean, does this guy need therapy? Does he not know who he is? How come it's God, son of God, now son of man? Which is it? Once again, as Messiah, identifying the different roles that he was fulfilling. God in Abad, Messiah propitiation, that I identified with the Son of Man. Now again, I do not have the time to take you into Ezekiel and Daniel and all these other wonderful scriptures that are in here, but I will give you some clues, as I said before, for you to be students of the Bible so that you can give the proper test to things that you read. But it is not a contradiction for him being the Son of God and the Son of Man because in the scriptures it shows real clearly that the phrase the Son of Man is in reference in broad significance to his deity. First of all, let me remind you that the word son of man, again, is by no reference saying that he was not divine. Because one is not the subtraction, but it actually the other. By becoming a man, he did not cease by being God. But son of man is used in the Bible in contexts of his deity, as I said. The Bible says that only God can forgive sins. Okay, just jot this one down. I didn't give this to you. Isaiah 43, 25. I recognized this morning. I didn't make a slide for you on this. On Isaiah 43, 25, it says this. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake. And I will remember, I will not remember your sins. Many other scriptures where the Old Testament, the God alone is able to forgive sins. But now please take your Bibles and go with me to Mark chapter 2, verse 7. Mark chapter 2, verse 7. Mark 2, verse 7. Are you following me? Is it making sense? Yes. Praise God. Told you we'd see a miracle today. Because I have been told listening to waxers is like getting a drink of water from a fire hydrant. So I don't know how true that is, but uh, Mark chapter 2, find me at verse 7. Notice what the word of God says so you can read it with your own eyes. And when this man, why does this man speak this way? The Pharisees are saying he is what? Blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? The Pharisees who knew the law very clearly identify this. Verse 8. And immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven or to say, arise and take up your pallet and walk. Verse 10 is the slam dunk. But in order that you may know, and please listen to this, dear one, that the Son of Man, underline that, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then he goes on and does it and heals the brother and forgives him of all of his sins. If God alone can do it, he says, well, so that you'll know that the Son of Man, he's saying the Son of Man is God. Let's connect the dot. 
Let's complete the picture. And what you'll find is the divine trinity of the word of God. Guys, I could go on with Ancient of Days that represents his deity. I could go on with the Kinsman Redeemer, which represents his humanity and the things that he would stand in our stead and our replace. I don't have the time to do that this morning. But like I said, I wanted to introduce these things to us. But my closing comments are this to us, and that is this. The limitation is ours, not his. Please, let me have your attention this way. If I put you to sleep at all, if you can wake up for this last closing comment. Or four. The limitation is ours, not his. When people sit down, and I'm sharing with them the Trinity, and they're having a hard time with it. Well, I don't see how three could be one. And if Jesus was God, a certain cult says to me all the time, then who is he praying to? If he is here and he says only the Father knows, then how could Jesus be God? And who would he be praying to when he was down here? I think, well, that is a limitation because they said you can't be in two places at the same time. Humans can't. Finite beings can't. The infinite can. The Almighty can. Amen? Simple quantum physics. Here's the earth. All of us live right here on the earth. The earth rotates as it goes around the sun, right? Okay, so here's the sun, here's the earth. One day, two days, three days, four days, five days, six days, seven days. A week for everyone living here on my finger. For us in this room, it was about two and a half seconds. A full week, two and a half sec. I just taught you quantum physics, Einstein. On a finger. <laughs> Relativity. Time, space, continuum. God is beyond. He can play ping pong with himself. Because he's God. Hello. We keep wanting to put him into our shell. My point is simply this to the dear ones. I can't explain to you the combustion motor in a car. If it breaks, I go, Rich. And yet every day, I'll put my life in it, I'll put a key in it, and I will drive with exceeding death danger in something that I can't fully explain. Why then do we say, well, if that doesn't make sense to me, then it can't be true. You and I cannot define how and why the clouds, the skies, all these other different things happened. Yet we know they happen. And so for these reasons, guys, our limitation should not be God's. Amen? Take your Bibles and let's go back to 1 John 4 and we're going to read it one last time and we will be done. All that we've said this morning, now let's put it back in the context of our three verses that we read. 1 John 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out in the world. By this you know that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that's from God. Verse 3. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the anti-Christ, opposed to, not for Christ, of which you have heard that is coming and now is already in the world. Folks, what an amazing truth as we read this in this Sunday morning in 2008 here in Kaimuki Auditorium. It says, you know, that, that attitude that's going to be challenging who Jesus is. It's here now and it's going to be coming. Guys, the Bible is clear that there is going to be one who is going to be so anti-Christ, he is called the Antichrist. And he will deceive and he will draw all peoples to himself. We are a world that is in a vacuum of leadership. There is no Churchill on the scene. There is no Lincoln. There is no individual that the entire world rallies and says, this is a man or a woman of total and complete integrity. And this individual is going to come with such deceptive power, the Bible says, that if you are not able to discern whether or not this is Christ or not, God or not, then the Bible says he will be able to deceive and if possibly even the elect. It's important that you know what it says in here. Please don't just find it on the floor of your car on Sunday and bring it in the room and learn and listen. That's great. 
But I gather as the chef to stir the things up, to throw in a few more ingredients. But the weekly digestion, the daily digestion needs to be ours. Folks, Jesus clearly claimed to be God on many occasions. He did it the right way by fulfilling the word of God. In addition to being divine, he was also human and he has two complete natures. Jesus is all God and all man in one person. And why is that important? It's important because of this. Because of his humanity, I can approach. Listen to me. Because of his humanity, I can now, as we worship, I can approach not a mist, not a force, not a power, but a person who has a face, who has a memory, who has a heart, who loves you. You see, I don't know what you're going through. But Jesus does. And I'm going to invite you to come to Jesus. Not to Christian doctrine, Christian theology, come to one love, but come to Jesus. And no one can introduce that to you better than Chris Rice. So Chris is going to lead us in our first worship song. And I invite you on this song just to bring your heart before him. The words will be above. So if you want to sing along, sing it. If you want to go do your communion during that time, do it. But after Chris leads us in a song, Jack's going to lead us in one song. And we're going to go. But guys, this isn't the time to zip up books. This isn't the time to move around. This is the time for us to recognize why is it so important that I have a God who is all God and all man because he's all God. He's more powerful than any of my needs. Amen. Amen. And because he's all man, he knows exactly what my needs are. Hallelujah. Let's come to Jesus.